We meet this morning in a city known for its strength, among people known for their resilience. You know, when Stephen said that you all had to file out here up to the, the parliamentary theatreette, I thought he meant the Senate or the House of Representatives. So it was uh, new to me because, you know, politicians say they care about Australians, they care about our economy, but most times they don't. Well, I find that they don't care about you, our citizens or our businesses. So in year one after election, what they normally do is blame their opponents on how bad things are. Then they collect enough money as they can together. And in the second year of a term of government, I find that they continue for a while to collect more and more cash, close more and more programs down, so that finally in year three, they can release all that money to the community and say it was hard, it was difficult. But if we hadn't made those decisions in year one or two, you wouldn't want to re-elect us now. I know that's a cynical view, but it's the way I look at it when I look at the economy and what's really happening in this country. And I see, say even from both sides of politics for a long time, this is the pattern that's emerged in Australia. And who suffers? It's our pensioners, our single mothers, members of the economy. And we don't become, as a nation, what we could become and what growth we could enjoy. When the truth prevails over injustice, we've got a, a country that we can really be proud of and we've got an economy that we can really support, that can support our people. And we have to project forward to create a better future for those around us because at the moment there's no confidence in our community that things will get, get better. While there's no confidence things will get worse because people won't invest and they won't make the difficult decisions to commit their capital to the expansion of the nation. So today I'm not talking about uh, reviewing the budget, I'm talking about setting the truth free to so we get a realisation of what the economy is all about and what the true story is about government finances in this nation. You've all got a little book on, I think, there which will take you through the slides. But firstly, I want to talk about the general government net debt as a percentage of the GDP. Here you can see in blue the Australian government debt in, in blue, uh, uh, as a percentage of its GDP. And today, the last figures we've got from the OECD and the International Monetary Fund is that our net debt's around about 12% of our GDP. How does that compare? It means we're the third lowest debt country in the OECD. The average um, net debt for countries in the OECD, advanced economies like ours, is 73%. So if I was in business, if I was competing with anyone, being the third lowest is not a bad situation when we look at the people who are the, who are the lowest, people like Norway, who have got a very large mineral deposit and a very large revenue base. We can't really compete with them. So how good's it got to be? And when you have a look at the trend, how the um, debt's increased from all countries in the world, you'll see that the ratio between us and the, top and the average performance has stayed the same. So relatively speaking, we're not in a bad shape at all. If we look at the government general net financial liabilities as a percentage of nominal GDP, we see that Australia in red, on, uh, you can see there, is 11.8 per cent. So again, we're very, very low. If we look at the United States of America, they're 81 per cent of their, their GDP is in general government net debt. The United Kingdom, 65 per cent. Uh, European area, 68 per cent. So total OECD is 69.1. Yet Australia is 11.8 per cent and we've got a debt crisis. If we have a look at the Australian government debt uh, in the general sector, you'll see that our debt, as I said, is 12.1 per cent and that's the pattern of debt over a number of years. You'll see when we were in a surplus there, it was when we sold a, a, lot, a lot of our assets. We had no debt when, we, when the government under the Howard administration decided some, to sell some of our assets. Again, if we look at gov uh, general government gross financial liabilities, we see that we're at 33.1 per cent. Japan's at 224 per cent. Portugal, 139 per cent. The United States, 104 per cent. The United Kingdom, 99.3 per cent. So that, if I was looking at this as, as a competitive balance sheet in a company, I wouldn't say that we're doing too bad. But what about our interest payments? What's the pattern look like on our interest payments? Australian government interest payments. You can see there that we've come down to a, a we're at about 0.6 per cent of GDP is our annual interest service in charge. Doesn't seem to be too extraordinary to me to be paying 0.6 of your total gross domestic product. And of course, that's among the lowest in the world as well. So 
It's disturbing to me that we, have, that we are where we are in this political debate and that the truth's, the truth's not out. Again, the Australian Consumer Price Index, you'll see, currently is at 2.9 per cent, the fourth lowest in the OECD. So we're doing pretty well. What about unemployment? Our unemployment rate compared to the OECD, we're at just 5.8 uh, per cent. The OECD is running at 7.9 per cent. So in business or anything else, it's about comp competition. Politicians talk a lot about competition, but they don't like competition among themselves. And that's what our party sought to give them in the last couple of years and to face up to some of these interest interesting facts. It seems to be in politics in Australia that who's ever in government, they fail and you pay. If you're in business and you fail, you know pretty quickly, don't you? Because you've got to find the money, you've got to keep yourself going, you've got to sustain yourself. In governments, it's totally different. Government just gets more inefficient, the structure gets more clumsy, and they'll come up with some other tax to tax you. Now, we've just seen in the recent budget the introduction of the, the debt levy. We have to have a debt levy. The Liberal Party, who's the low taxing party of Australia, who has a policy for 40 years of low taxations, decided to put a 2 per cent tax on. And what will that do? That will just take more and more money away from the money supply. It will it'll cushion down domestic demand and it will mean a lot of our businesses close. Our public cash benefits as a percentage of GDP tell another story. They tell us the story of how we compare as a nation with other nations in relation to our social security budget and what we pay our pensioners. Australia is about 11, uh, sorry, about just over 8 per cent, while the United States, one of the most socialist economies in the world, is just, under, just over 9.9. 9. So we pay less money percentage of our GDP out than the United States does. Italy's up to 18 per cent, and the OECD average is closer to 14 or 15 per cent, nearly double what we pay people in social security in this country. I know when I, before I looked at these figures, I had a different impression. But then you look at these figures and say, why is it so? What's happening to this country? And what are the consequences? If we go forward, we can have a look at public social expenditure as a percentage of GDP. And you can see Australia, the broken dotted line at the bottom, we're among the lowest in the world. You know, we're, we're below the United States, United Kingdom, New Zealand, Germany, France, Japan, other comparative countries. So before we start looking at the economy, we've got to look at the truth and see where we are. Of course, for many years, people have said that we spend too much money in health and probably we could do better in health, make it more efficient. But let's have a look at our total expenditure in health as a percentage of GDP. You find that we're spending 8.9 per cent in health and in the United States, where 60 million people have no coverage at all, they're spending 17.7 per cent of their GDP in health. So you'd have to say that our health system's performing better, it's leaner, and it must be more efficient than a health system in the United States that's taking up 17.7 per cent of expenditure. So there's this, uh, this uh, question that if we privatise things, we get them better. In the United States, you've got a fairly privatised health system, but of course it hasn't performed as well as Australia. There's another old saying that if, if it's not broke, you don't need to fix it. Right? Generally speaking, the budget uh, economic criteria uh, that we've got a debt problem is just bullshit. You know? It's rubbish. You know? And if you talk to anyone at the OECD and the IMF, they'll tell you that. As an Australian, I don't think that's a good thing for our government not to be true with its citizen and to set up a policy debate all about nothing. Let's assume it's right. Let's assume we want to reduce our budget by $30 billion because it's not sustainable. Well, how could we do it without dealing with the rats and mice across our economy, which destroys domestic demand and will spiral the wealth creation of this country down? Firstly, what would I do if I was Prime Minister? Well, we've got the NBN. We're spending $45 billion on the NBN to get better internet coverage in Australia. And if we have a look at the country, we break it down, there's really only about a $7 billion worth of, ex of that expenditure that we need to go to places in Australia where there's no internet coverage, where commerce and business, and we need that infrastructure to grow. If we look at places like Sydney and Melbourne, there's a good domestic demand there, and industry can meet those needs, and so they should, 
government can't meet it efficiently. So if we took $7 billion off the $45 billion for the NBN, we'd have another $38 billion. If we look at our submarines, we could buy off-the-shelf submarines that could be built in, in South Australia um, from, from the United States, take some of their submarines, which have much better capacity, establish a new industry in North Australia to service them, to service the US fleet. Instead of paying the, the, the projected $37 billion, we'd pay, 20, uh, we'd pay $10 billion and save another $27 billion. So if we total that up, what are we up to now? About $55 billion off the budget by just those two decisions. If we scrapped paid parental leave, because I believe paid parental leave is something between me and my employees. A lot of my female employees have paid parental leave because they bargain for it, just as some people bargain for salary sacrificing or that. It's something my responsibility, and we have a paid parental scheme far better than it's currently got. I give the women that work for me that because they're worth it. I want to keep them. They're talented. I really need them. It's something to do about the workplace. The rights of a citizen are really about uh, are being a citizen of Australia. It's inequitable to say that stay-at-home mums, um, people working with their husbands on a farm, should, should be eligible on a different basis. We don't want those sort of divisions in our country. I don't want them because it costs the budget $20 billion. So those three decisions would take us up to $75 billion in saving. If we scrap direct action, which is just a substitute, a really a token benefit to, uh, to please a particular group of Australians that doesn't please them at all, that would take us up to $80 billion. If we eliminated duplication between the federal government and the states, where everyone in Canberra is doing what everyone in Sydney and Melbourne are doing inefficiently, we could save up to, in my estimate, another $100 billion in our economy. I mean, I took over a refinery in North Queensland that was going to close down with a um, $6 billion refinery. We looked at the decisions. It was a major company that was running it. We took our production costs down from $11 to $5.50 because it was, a, it was a bureaucratic nature. It had been developed over a number of years. There was a lot of waste and there was no, no, no KPIs about what we should do. The same is true with all our government. We can't just say we're going to sack 16,000 public servants and save money. If you're running a business, you've got to know who you're going to sack, who's going to take over those tasks, how's the workflow going to, going to go ahead. You just can't make decisions like this until you've got solutions. Anyway, that gives us over $100 billion of savings. If our politicians had a political brain in their body, they'd realise that any of those decisions I've just mentioned to you are much more palatable than what we're currently doing in our budget. And they'd realise that th some of those decisions wouldn't affect our economy as much as they could do. So that deals with um, where we are at the moment, what the truth is. It deals with what we could do if we did want to save $30 billion, if you believe Joe Hockey. But what we might become is far more exciting. There's so many structural impediments in our country that need to be removed to enable us to be all that man could be, free and independent. And if you have a look at some of the things we need to do, I'm, I've always been a great criticism of provisional tax in this country, where our businesses are required to pay tax in advance of them earning a profit. And, uh, you know, if we look in the Ford estimates, there's about $70 billion of provisional tax coming into the government. Now, if we change the reporting date on that from the beginning of the year to the end of the year after we know what our results are, after we know we've actually earned a profit, we'd release $70 billion into the economy in, through our business structures. We create more demand and, and more money supply to create more economic activity. Why should Australia be compared with other countries, you'd have a system where it fights behind its back. How many small businesses do you know that have never got enough money? Why they haven't got enough money to stimulate the economy is because the government takes it off them even before they've earned it. If we looked at other structural changes now, on the $70 billion, if that money stays in our economy and in the hands of individuals and it turns over just three times, we increase our revenue by $21 billion through GST. If it, if it does that. Um, we also stop a lot of people losing their jobs. We create more jobs by real demand, real activity, creates more group tax. So the government gets more and more revenue, more hospitals, more schools, an expanding economy, being what we could be. The Australian government's the number one petitioner in this country of bankruptcies and liquidations. 
They take people from productive employment to unemployment. They transfer them from the private enterprise section of our society into the dependent section through Centrelink. If we had, like they do have in the United States, a Chapter 11 structure, where all that was dealt with was the equity of a business, it becomes a very efficient process. Many managers are inefficient, don't know what to do, can't provide proper guidance and management for their people. If they lost their equity in the business, but the enterprise continued, we wouldn't lose the exports. We wouldn't move people from in employment into unemployment. And of course, government revenue would get better and would still have some of the exports that we lose by closing our own businesses down. It just doesn't make sense that our government try and criteria is to close our businesses down. If you go to the United States, you look at Chapter 11 and analyse that, you see that 85 per cent of all enterprises that go into Chapter 11 emerge as successful businesses, yet our government wants to close them down. Other things we could do, of course, is, is tax reform in this country. We've got a tax act, which is so complicated that one company makes a lot of money out of selling uh, books every year to say you know what the tax section says, PwC prospers and gets a lot wealthier than other Australians, and we need to really change our tax system to make it simpler. We need to take on some of the recommendations that people like PwC, Ernst & Young have made for years about our tax system so that our businesses can get more efficient. We re need to review the public service, not just from the context of cutting, but for, from creating more wealth. There wouldn't be one public service in Canberra that wouldn't know that he couldn't be more efficient than he currently is, that he couldn't provide more than he currently can to serve the economy, to make it stronger and better as an Australian. But he can't do it because in the middle are politicians stopping him to doing that. In the middle is a lot of fear, fear about telling the Australian people what the truth is, because overall they're requiring to be elected at the next election. They're depending upon that. I donate to charity all of my salary. If I'm not elected next time, I, my wife will be happier, my family will be better, so it's not a major concern for me. So while I'm here in Parliament, my preeminent thing is to do the right thing by the nation, to address the issues that we have to address, and to try to generate some growth in this country. President Obama, since the GFC, has injected over $85 billion a month into the US system. He's grown his economy, he's got stronger. He's recently turned that back after two and a half years to injecting $65 billion a month in the US system. Employment's come down, exports have increased, the United States has become stronger. In the, in the, in the difference to Europe, Europe has uh, gone into austerity, it's cut back, it's lost its exports. The United States has taken more and more exports off the, off the, off the Europeans. As Australians you know, operating in business, we should want to compete. We should want to be out there doing all we can to make this country stronger, to make us more competitive and to create demand. It all rests with the money supply, how you, how you divvy it up, where you're going to spend it, and it rests with confidence. Our leaders should be people that go forward to see that this country could be all that it could be. We should tr tr remember that we've got an obligation to fulfil the, the dreams of the Anzacs to make Australia a stronger and a better country. And why is it, for example, if you want to export nickel ore to Japan, you might get $50 a tonne for it? Why is it that the Japanese can turn it into nickel in Japan, which is one of the things I'm in, and sell the nickel for $20,000 on the world market that can create jobs? Why can the Japanese become the second biggest economy in the world off the back of Australian resources? Why can't Australians do it? Because their wages are higher than ours, their energy costs are more than ours, and um, they suffer from the tyranny of distance and use our resources. Why can't we take the resources we've got in, in Queensland and Western Australia and have them developed into downstream processing to provide commodities on the world market in Melbourne and in Sydney? Why can't we have a structural change? Why can't the government take a leadership position and not talk about saving jobs in a manufacturing industry that we can't compete in, but one that we can compete in, where we can be preeminent in the world, where we've got the facilities and the resources to do this? And in the final analysis, you've got to remember that Australia is one of only 13 nations in the world that's got a triple A credit rating, 13 of them. That's not too bad. So we do have the capacity, if there's a will in the government, to take a leadership role. If you look how Wyala was developed, if you look how Newcastle was developed, it was developed with the government taking a lead and supporting industry so we could compete internationally. And all Australians benefited by the development of BHP in the last century and beyond. 
So our government can take the same policies that are operating in Japan and Korea and other places where their people have become stronger and we've become weaker. We need to have people in government who know what the real game is and to do something about it. But this country is a great country. We're not in a difficult situation that we can't manage. The problems that we do have have been made by Australians and they can be solved by Australians too. We're not hopelessly adrift of a, on, a, on a sea of indifference where we can do nothing to sustain ourselves or to have a better future. And that's the reason why I'm in politics, because I think it's time that this country moved again. Thanks very much.